All right, so it is uh, 10 o'clock here in British Columbia, and um, I think 1 o'clock in Eastern Time, 12 o'clock in Central Time, so we are going to get started. Um, there will probably be people that, who continue to roll in past the hour, as is often the case. Um, but if everyone could remind you, um, remind yourselves to to keep yourself on mute, just because everyone is able to hear the audio and the feedback, so that would be great. Uh, we have uh, a lot of interest in the webinar today, so um, um, just if we, everyone could try to remember to do that, that would be wonderful. Um, so I should introduce myself. Uh, it's Christine here. I'm the Communications and Special Projects Lead with the Canadian Freshwater Alliance. And for those of you uh, for whom this is your first webinar with the Freshwater Alliance, we're a national initiative that seeks to build, strengthen, connect, and support the freshwater movement in Canada. I'm based in Kelowna, BC on unceded silks territory today. Uh, so as I mentioned, there is a lot of interest in the webinar today. I'm really excited about it, and I'm very excited that um, our speakers could join us. Uh, we have some very talented and knowledgeable speakers, and so I really uh, I do hope you'll find it useful. Um, again, if you could keep yourself muted throughout the duration of the webinar, that would be wonderful. There is a chat box in the control panel, um, so you can feel free to introduce yourself in the chat box if you'd like. And also, we'll have some time at the end of the webinar for questions for the speakers. So um, if you have questions that come up as the, the speakers are presenting, you can feel free to add those into the chat box as you go along, or we'll also have dedicated time at the end. Um, we are recording the webinar today, so if, um, if you know someone who signed up and wasn't able to attend, uh, we will be circulating that as well. Um, before we get right into it, I just wanted to give a little bit of context about how this webinar came to be today. So the Freshwater Alliance has been co-hosting a community of practice with Green Communities Canada um, about green infrastructure over the past year, and we have about 15 nonprofit organizations from across the country who have been participating with us. And together we've been working uh, together to increase our own knowledge and expertise, but also to uh, push the envelope a little bit in uh, our own communities and also uh, at a broader scale around green infrastructure. And at a meeting a few months ago, one of our members based in Montreal brought up an interesting point that we are increasingly seeing a shift toward rain as a resource when it comes to planning our cities and the role of green infrastructure, but it doesn't really seem like our practice with regard to snow is as evolved. You know, we tend to melt it, clear it, suck it up, pile it up, get it out of the way. Uh, and so in that community of practice meeting, the member wanted to know whether anyone else on the call or if, um, if other municipalities had a different approach to snow and maybe even use green infrastructure to treat snow as a resource as well. So I got myself into a bit of a research frenzy, and honestly, I couldn't find very many examples of places that explicitly talked about design or maintenance of green infrastructure for snow or ice or melt or all of those concerns. Um, but eventually, I did come across the Stormwater Center at the University of New Hampshire and the city of Milwaukee, who have some interesting knowledge and experience to share today. Uh, so I'm very excited to welcome Tom, Elizabeth, and Sarah to the webinar. Um, Tom will um, start us off today, and then we'll hear from Elizabeth and Sarah. So Tom Ballestero is an associate professor of civil engineering, civil and environmental engineering at the University of New Hampshire, and he's also the director of the Stormwater Center there. He's been working for over 40 years um, as a hydrologist and water resources engineer. Elizabeth is the sustainability program coordinator for the city of Milwaukee, where she works on green infrastructure and sustainable water projects with the goal of establishing Milwaukee as America's water-centric city. And then we are also joined by Sarah, who is also with the city of Milwaukee, and she is there as an engineer with the public works department, managing the maintenance of bioswales and is also a part of the Downspout Disconnection Program Coordination Team. So welcome, Tom, Elizabeth, and Sarah. I'm so grateful that you're able to join us here today. And um, without further ado, I'm going to um, pass it over to Tom um, to be the presenter here. Um, there you are, Tom. Okay, I'm just going to send that dialog box over to you now, and then you should be able to show your screen. Can you see my screen now? Um, not quite yet. There we go. Yes, we can see it now. Perfect. Okay. Uh, thank you, Christine, and thanks the uh, Alliance for inviting me to uh, share some of our uh, expertise with you. Um, 
Christine gave me five different charges, and uh, normally that would take me about four or five hours to go through it, but I'm going to do it in 20 minutes. Um, the first thing I wanted to do is go over an overview of systems. And for the overview of the types of systems I'll be talking about today, uh, some of the green infrastructure systems, uh, permeable pavements, uh, bioretention systems, wetlands, and some of the subsurface systems will be in my comments today. And if you're not familiar with these, for bioretention systems, typically there's some kind of a pretreatment. And then the bioretention system itself is just a manufactured soil. And then there may or may not be an underdrain, uh, depending on whether or not you can get a lot of infiltration or even if you want infiltration. But basically, this is a media filter. That's how the systems fundamentally work. Um, the subsurface gravel wetland you may not be familiar with, but basically uh, from pretreatment water comes in and it basically goes into stone that is underneath the system. And at the outlet of the system, the outlet is basically at the level of the wetland soil surface and that keeps the stone saturated, which then allows it to go anaerobic which then allows denitrification to occur. So the, the subsurface gravel wetland was one of the first systems that really uh, was focusing on nitrogen reduction. And since this um, system came onto the scene, the bioretention systems have been modified to have quote unquote wet feet. That is, they'll have an internal storage volume to do the denitrification as well. And that design is based on the characteristics of the subsurface gravel wetland system. And then uh, permeable pavements, a very common cross-section looks like this. Typically, the permeable pavement is right at the surface. Below that is some type of a um, um, stone layer, a choker course as it's known, which acts as a beam to support the pavement above and to disperse the tr stress of uh, whatever traffic you have on that to the soil below. Not all systems have the next layer, the bank run gravel, um, but basically it's a coarse sand to a fine gravel. That's where you get a lot of water quality improvement. Some designs will just have stone and basically um, after it goes through the pavement and basically you get water quality improvement by uh, filtration at the surface. You may get some surface reactions in the stone, but then at the bottom it can either infiltrate and if you want infiltration, you might have a very deep stone layer and you would have the under drain at the top if you even need an under drain. If you have uh, lower permeability soils, you would need the under drain. And if you don't want infiltration, you might have a very thin stone layer and the under drain would actually be at the bottom of that layer. Um, and then in, more and more we see in urban systems, urban areas where you don't have the land space for a bioretention or a subsurface gravel wetland. Uh, we call these subsurface gravel filter systems, or they may actually be subsurface voids. Uh, but basically you capture the water in um, the street. That goes into the stone below these systems and fills them up. Ultimately, if they do fill up, they would drain back into conventional infrastructure and into, say, the conventional urban sewer system. But you also have the ability for infiltration in these systems. So that's just the overview. Um, so the first charge I was given, uh, how is the performance in cold locations? Um, this is the temperature norms for where we are in Durham, New Hampshire. And if you follow the purple line, uh, December, January, and February, our average, annual, our average monthly temperatures are below freezing. So um, we typically can see anywhere from one to three weeks of below freezing weather. So we certainly have uh, cold conditions here. And <clears throat> we typically get about um, maybe 48 inches of precipitation a year, of which an, on an average year we'll get about four feet of snow. So for performance, uh, what you see are a series of graphs. And on the vertical axis is the removal efficiency. So basically, that's the percentage of the pollutant that the system takes out. And the four panels you're looking at is in the upper left, subsurface gravel wetland, upper right, vegetated swale, lower left, a bioretention system, lower right, a retention pond. And then across the bottom of each are these five pollutants that we're looking at, total suspended solids, total petroleum hydrocarbons, uh, diesel range, dissolved inorganic nitrogen, zinc, and total phosphorus. 
And so the different bars are demonstrating whether or not there's a seasonal effect. So the yellow bar is the removal efficiency of these pollutants in the summer. The blue is in the winter and the green, green would be the average annual removal. And the concentrations you see across the top of each of these figures is the average um, event mean concentration for that particular. So for example, total suspended solids has an average influent concentration of 55 and a half milligrams per liter. And so what you can see is if you look at the gravel wetland, um, you can see there's hardly any performance penalty. That is the removal efficiency summer and winter are very similar for sediment, for hydrocarbons, dissolved inorganic nitrogen, zinc. And we do see a little bit of a difference for phosphorus. Um, and I would be cautious about using these as uh, there's no statistical testing here. I haven't you shown you the error bars. Uh, some of this could be due to the loading, the type of sediment, because typically phosphorus is sediment associated. Um, and um, the other uh, complication is when you have a very low concentration of the pollutant on the influent and you just get out a little bit, you have a poor removal efficiency, yet all in all, you had a very low amount of concentration or load coming into the system. So um, basically when you look across these, there is some significance to what we see in the swales for sediment and zinc. A lot of the swales just pave over with ice in the winter. For the bioretention systems, um, there is a marked performance for the removal of nitrogen. They're not usually good at nitrogen removal unless you have that internal storage volume. And then for the retention pond, again, um, not a huge difference in uh, statistically speaking in the performance. So all in all, uh, if we throw in hydrodynamic separators, which typically we use for pretreatment, not a huge penalty in going from uh, warmer weather to cooler weather. The biggest thing one would expect is um, if you're using salt for uh, your transportation surfaces, the effect of salt and temperature combined tend to uh, change the settling velocity of sediment. And so the effect is to, in this case, increase the settling time. So one would expect something like a hydrodynamic separator or a pond to see poorer performance for sediment and any pollutants associated with sediment in the winter months. Um, these systems do freeze. So we use a very simple device developed by the US Army Cold Regions uh, Research and Engineering Lab. And basically you have a well, a small diameter well, plastic well, that's screened all the way down through the earth. And then we have this clear plastic tube that we fill with water mixed with a uh, blue powder. And as you know, when the water freezes, it will push the color, the powder in this case, down below it. And so you can see the depth of frost here. So we would put these in the ground. They go all the way to the ground surface and down a, um, maybe about four or five feet. And we can measure the depth of frost through the winter. And you can see the, the um, reference for the uh, field assembled frost gauge. So this is a busy diagram, but it's looking at how these systems freeze. You have time across the top, and so this is the winter of 2005 from January to March. Right-hand vertical axis is the average daily temperature, degrees C, and so the red line is the average daily temperature, and you can see that uh, the dashed blue line is zero C or freezing, and there's in January almost a two-week period where the average temperature is below freezing, then it warms up a little bit, and then in February again we have about a two-week period where it's below freezing, warms up, and then in March we have another week where it's below freezing. The bars, you only see two colored sets of bars on uh, the vertical axis, which is zero at the top on the left, and increasing. That's the depth of frost in the ground in centimeters. So the purple line is the sand filter and the um, bluish line is the subsurface gravel wetland. We were measuring the bioretention system, but this particular year it didn't grow frost in it. Um, and so what you see is the vertical green lines are days in the winter that we actually get a rainfall event. So I'm not giving you the depth of rain, it just rained and there was runoff. So in this very first period in February, you can see where it starts getting cold, it rained, there's no frost in the systems. 
And then by late Feb by late January, the sand filter and the gravel wetland, you can see that the depth of frost is growing in both of them. We get to this warming period in the beginning of February, and you can see that the frost depth is decreasing in these systems. It rains and the frost is gone. So the take home message is, yes, these systems freeze, but once you get the runoff, they thaw out very, very quickly. They're not turned into skating ponds in the winter. And you can see this in the next freezing period at the end of February into March, it, uh, you get frost in the systems, it rains and the frost is gone. On the next slide, again, busy slides, but these this is a porous asphalt system. And in the porous asphalt system, you see the winter of 2008 in the upper panel, the winter of 2007 in the lower panel. Again, temperatures on the right-hand vertical axis, and the dashed line is the air temperature. And so when this dashed line goes below zero, that would be a freezing condition. On the left vertical axis is depth of frost, and there's two lines or two trajectories. The solid line is the porous asphalt. The dashed line is a frost gauge in the soil away from the porous asphalt. And so what you see is we get into this cold period in January in 2008 and the frost starts in the soil. And the frost continues in the soil even though you can see where there are some dashed lines where we're getting these vertical dashed lines are the rainfall events. Compared that to the porous asphalt, which again, you see freezes not only sooner, but deeper than the soil. If you've ever seen the figures bridge freezes before road surface, it's because the cold air can flow all around the bridge. Similarly, cold air can flow into and out of the porous asphalt. So it freezes, but it freezes as a porous media. It's not a solid ice block. Once you get a rainfall event, you see that uh, um, melts very quickly. Once it goes below freezing after this first big pipe, this first big uh, spike where um, we go below freezing in mid-February, the frost grows again. We get another rainfall event and that rain event basically thought it for the rest of the year. So additionally, at the end of the winter season, the permeable pavements thaw out before the soils and they thawed much faster. And that is reflected also in what happened in 2007. So again, these pavements are going to freeze sooner and they're going to thaw sooner. And a lot of it is because air can still move through, through them even though technically they're frozen. And if that doesn't convince you, uh, this is a time series in 2011, we buried some thermistors in a permeable pavement. So the red line is the air temperature and you can see where the air temperature goes below zero in uh, late January. And then the temperature sensors are at the top of the gravel layer, in the middle of the gravel layer, in the bottom of the gravel layer, and in the gray line is the stone below. So you can see the top surface is the coldest. And as you go down into the ground, it does get warmer, but still the system is frozen throughout. So for uh, permeable pavements, uh, say compared to a retention pond, fairly good removal of hydrocarbons and sediment, uh, really no removal of uh, inorganic nitrogen because really there's no ability to denitrify here. Uh, zinc is and metals are typically sediment associated, so you do a decent job at removing the sediments. And again, there's not a lot of uh, penalty for cold weather here. Statistically, these are not different. So my next charge was to discuss designing rain gardens or bioswales for snow melt and snow piles. So uh, I'm going to just show you a case study of where we did this. And in this case study, basically, we looked at a two year study here in the nearby coastal town of Portsmouth, New Hampshire. So this was the winter of uh, 2015. We had a significant snowfall that winter and you can see them clearing the uh, snow, there's a parking ban when they know these events are going to come. They move all the snow into the streets and then they put it into trucks, clear the streets off, and they move it to a snow dump. If this center of this figure is the city of Portsmouth, over on Pierce Island where the yellow circle is, is where the snow dump is located. So this was the snow dump before we got on scene. And basically what you're looking at is the flat parking surface or the transportation surface that is holding the meltwater 
Um, basically, there's no management. Uh, the water runs off from the snow pile you're looking at, and it goes right into the estuary. So again, another picture of the snow pile. You can see the estuary to the right in the background. And again, another picture of the snow pile. And we've all seen these snow pile, piles. We know how black they turn this time of year. <clears throat> so what we did was uh, to try to figure out, one, how much snow we're going to get. But there's really no design guidance for how large you should make, say, a fire retention system. Um, so we estimated the amount of snow we would get and therefore how much snow was going to these snow piles. We had some estimates of uh, the type of um, total su suspended solids we should expect. And uh, when we actually took our data, we were kind of in that range, although we found some concentrations much higher than the Alaska study. So this is our site and the blue is where the snow dump is. And the system design was pretreatment is a buried concrete vault. And then the water basically is going into that to settle out the large sediment, take out gross solids if there's any floatables like paper or trash, and then it goes into a bioretention system. The bioretention system under drain then goes into the estuary. <clears throat> For the looting, uh, the, the design, we looked at pretreatment, that's the concrete vault. And it's a static sizing as most, most bioretention systems or green infrastructure are statically sized to hold a known volume of water. And uh, what we did was statically size a bioretention system as you would normally do for rainfall and just to understand how it would perform. However, the difference is normally pretreatment, you have almost no volume of storage. And what we tried to do is design the pretreatment to contain what we estimated to be half of the inflow volume of sediment. That was the idea. And so uh, we could estimate the amount of snow. We knew the estimated concentration of the sediment. And uh, we did a standard bioretention cell design. We did the pretreatment design. And then uh, again, the pretreatment design was to hold at least a volume equal to half of the sediment volume we were expecting, recognizing that we would have to be just looking at it periodically over the winter and just clean it out with a vector truck. So figures of what that pretreatment looked like, uh, cutaway view and a plan view. So these are the data we got, uh, basically fairly consistent snow water equivalents both winters. One winter we got hit very early on and the other was a more gradual snow load in, in 2015. And when we looked, we would sample the snow pile, look at the concentrations from our estimates of the volume that, that was there, we could look at the mass of pollutants. And so you see total mass is a log scale on the vertical on the left. And you can see how these concentrations built up in both years. And then we were measuring the outflow from these systems. And so basically the blue bars are the mass of contaminants that go to that uh, snow dump. And if you did nothing, the green bar would be what you um, were, were basically retaining, uh, I'm sorry, exporting, and the purple bar is with the uh, bioretention system. And again, that's a log scale. Converting that into removal efficiencies with the snow dump, we actually got very high removal efficiencies for all parameters we monitored, except of course chloride. So again, chloride is really difficult to remove. And even if you think you're removing it, it's probably gonna be flushed out later in the year. So that was my second charge. <clears throat> and I know I only have a few minutes left, but uh, bear with me. So this is a subservo scrabble filter. And again, in the winter, a lot of the times these systems are just covered with snow. And the question here is what's the maintenance? And I would just get, ask you to think about what's the maintenance for conventional infrastructure for roads, gutters, et cetera. Conventional is hope it functions over the winter, hope it doesn't freeze up. If there are snow or ice blockages, you clear them, you do your de-icing, plowing, and snow removal. That's basically what you do for green infrastructure. There's nothing really special you have to do in the winter. Um, I was asked about permeable pavement performance in the winter, and again, um, the whole 
basis of permeable pavement is the water goes in. Here you see where they're resurfacing a road with a porous pavement. So the underlayer is impermeable and it's a rainy day. You can see the spray where they haven't repaved with porous and where there is the porous overlay, you can see how the water has gone into the surface, creates no spray. So we actually looked at surfaces. Uh, to the left is a dense mix asphalt. Obviously, you can get ice built up on it. To the right is a porous asphalt. Um, when we use salt, there are EPA criteria for salt concentrations in receiving waters. And this is a stream that runs through the University of New Hampshire campus. Those criteria are not to be surpassed, but more than once only every three years. And you can see in one season, we exceed it multiple times. In fact, this one storm, we exceed it for almost a full day. So chloride is an issue, and where we find in New Hampshire the largest uh, offenders are, are not the public sector, but more the private sector, parking lots, et cetera. We've tried to rein this in by putting a limit on liability, and uh, if you get a certification, you can get a limit on your insurance liability, and uh, it actually is reducing the amount of salt that's put down. But in our study, um, we looked at plowing and we looked at salt application, so PA is porous asphalt, DMA is dense mixed, and you can see just the difference in plowing. <clears throat> in pervious concrete, if you have good solar cover, the left is the pervious concrete, nearby is a, poor, a, a dense mixed asphalt lot, and you can see how melt water actually will create ice. That doesn't happen on concrete or asphalt that's pervious, because once you get the melt water, it goes down, it goes into the pavement. But the pervious concrete and sun compared to partial sun or even shade, you have a problem. So solar gain is really important in order to minimize salt. Plowing alone is pretty good, but um, if you have uh, shade, you probably need some de-icing. Um, when we looked at this study, what you're looking at is two panels, the ice percent cover for porous asphalt and dense mix. Dense mix is the yellow, porous is the purple. purple. In the upper panel, what you're looking at is the percent ice cover with um, 100 percent of the normal salt application on both, 50 percent, 25 percent, and zero percent. And obviously the less salt you use, the more ice cover you have. However, more interestingly, there's a, a test for friction. And um, when we do the same applications of salt for those same two surfaces, what you find is, and I'll say this twice, in the right-hand column, the porous asphalt with no salt, just plowing, has basically the same frictional resistance as dense mixed asphalt with 100% of the recommended salt application. So basically, no salt on the permeable pavement, you have the same frictional or skid resistance. We've also looked at, because salt basically creates a brine pool, and on porous asphalt, that brine pool won't spread like on an impervious surface. So we've looked at liquid de-icers, potassium acetate, sugar beet sugar and salt brine, sugar beet uh, sugar and water, um, salt on porous asphalt, salt on dense mix, and um, dense mixed asphalt with uh, salt and no salt. So basically, statistically, um, this slide was cut off, statistically, this one dense mixed asphalt with no salt is statistically different than all the others. All the others, the liquid de-icers or even salt, basically give you the same frictional resistance. So big promise for liquid de-icers. So let me finish up. Um, there is an issue of human dimensions and there are a lot of concerns. And I, these are perceived barriers to implementation. And I'm not gonna read through all these, but these perceived barriers have very specific um, concerns. And again, they're just concerns, but most of the data finds these completely unfounded. Most of these barriers fit into four basic categories, human dimension, codes, construction, and basically sites that are overly constrained. EPA has done a great national study, and they identified that when you look at the life cycle costs, typically green infrastructure is much cheaper than conventional. And the big difference is in the piping you have to do for conventional. We've also done studies to look at maintenance and, and the annual maintenance cost per acre treated is very similar 
for conventional systems compared to green infrastructure systems. The challenges we run into is typically a challenge like, well, what happens if a 10,000 gallon gasoline tanker spills onto a porous asphalt? Well, ask that question of any system, even conventional in, uh, infrastructure. These are stormwater systems. If you're trying to build them for containment, you can do that, but you don't throw a challenge at a system that it's not designed for. Um, conventional green uh, infrastructure typically has no bar. So this is a pavement that uh, impermeable porous as uh, sorry, asphalt, and it had a crack after three years. No one batted an eye. This is a porous asphalt surface that a trucker drove on on a very hot summer day. And that was basically considered the end of the world. The whole pavement failed. And it's easily repaired, but again, there's a very high bar for green and no bar for conventional. Um, so my, my spiel would be, you know, once GI becomes part of our DNA that we make these decisions first, um, that will be helpful. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that Christine's going to be posting my talk, but there are uh, some key things that you need to have for success, and it takes a lot of different people working together. Um, codes can be changed. I give you a... Um, um, a website where you can find some of the codes we've listed. Uh, I'm just going to show uh, maybe uh, one slide. Typically, we find that green infrastructure is implemented where you see opportunities. So a lot of people will do optimization models to say where you should put it. But the reality is, if you have a site that you're starting to redevelop or construct, that's the time to do it. That's your opportunity. Um, the story I typically give, this is the city of Philadelphia. These planters were a thought that came up when the Pope was going to come to visit. Someone made the decision, we're going to beautify the city along the Pope's route. And these planters are still there. That's the kind of person that you need for green infrastructure decisions. Someone who will make the decision to say, this is what we're going to do. So uh, I know I ran a little bit over, but uh, that's my spiel. Wow. Thank you so much, Tom. That was a very tall order that I gave you, and uh, I think you did a fantastic job and even translated uh, the measurements into um, into Celsius for the Canadians. So thank you very much. <laughs> You're most welcome. All right. So now I'm going to hand it over to Sarah and Elizabeth. Um, you should get a little dialogue box popping up um, to share your screen. Perfect. We can see your screen yeah. now. Okay, um, good. Oh, geez, this should have been ready. <laughs> okay. And yeah, so Sarah and Elizabeth are, as I mentioned, from the city of Milwaukee, and they're going to talk a little bit about their own experience with green infrastructure, um, maintenance, and um, operations in winter weather. So uh, take it away. Awesome. Can you hear us okay? Can hear you great, yes. Okay. Perfect. Um, great. So um, I, Sarah and I are both going to, I'm Elizabeth, and we're both going to kind of um, go back and forth in our presentation um, based on what we're talking about. Um, so for those of you that aren't familiar with the city of Milwaukee, here's a little um, inside of the map. We're about an hour north of Chicago, and if there's any football fans out there, we're like two hours south of Green Bay. <laughs> um, we are at the intersection of three rivers and on um, the coast of Lake Michigan. Um, and this is a picture of our wonderful mayor, Mayor Tom Barrett. And so he has um, tasked the city with um, rolling out this water-centric city initiative. So it's um, really, oops, sorry. So really, Milwaukee is a city built on water with three rivers and a great lake. Um, water plays such a key role in our city's history, identity, and economy. Um, and this is a picture of uh, Mayor Barrett celebrating with us on World Water Day. He's giving out that rain barrel to a person in the community. So we have this water-centric city initiative, and it's um, for the whole city. Um, some of the categories that we've rolled out for a water-centric city initiative is water leadership, arts, talents, culture, and education, water technology, um, green infrastructure, which we're talking about today, um, water research, we have a goal of having fishable swimmable waters in the city, and then sustainable healthy water supply. And they're all kind of interconnected. Um, we're also a member of the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Cities Initiative, which is um, mayors from around the Great Lakes from the US and Canada, and they're working um, to protect and restore the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence River. 
And um, finally, we're also a member of the United Nations Global Compact Cities Program um, for water specifically. So we're an innovative, um, innovating city. We have a water business and technology cluster in the city. And we also, our local university has a graduate and PhD program in freshwater sciences. So under the um, this UN program and the Water Centric City Program, we try to work together on research and technology and coordination with um, all municipal departments. And here's just some pictures of um, us celebrating water in Milwaukee. You can see on the bottom left, that's uh, the research vessel that our local university uses. We do a lot of outreach to the community on green infrastructure and celebrating water around Milwaukee. Um, so the city does have a green streets plan, which we rolled out a few years ago. Um, so it's uh, the city of Milwaukee is designing city streets to reduce flooding risks, improve the quality of our lakes and rivers, and really to help the city adapt to a changing climate. Some of the effects of climate change that we've been seeing here in Milwaukee is increased flooding. So we're really trying to um, work on green infrastructure to tackle that. And really it's looking at um, opportunities when the city's repaving um, roads for bioretention basins and street medians, tree trenches, near sidewalks and other green infrastructure technologies. Um, and specific to green infrastructure in the winter time, the green streets plan that we have um, does lay out some good guidelines for porous pavements with plowing techniques. It suggests, it suggests using rubber tip for the plow um, so as not to damage any of the porous pavements. Um, some anecdotal evidence that we've heard is that it really isn't necessary, but it's a you know recommendation in the plan. Um, try to avoid using salt, especially salt sand mix on porous pavement if possible. And then really looking at the snow stockpiles um, to try to avoid stockpiles piling snow on medians that have bioretention basins um, because of the, um, the contaminants that could be in the snow melt. And um, this past winter, we had quite a bit of snow. We were almost running out of places to put the snow, but really um, trying to be aware of where those bioretention basins are and um, come up with an alternative snow dump site if needed. All right. All right, so um, to Sarah, and I'm going to go ahead and talk about uh, some of the things that I've found uh, in both designing and maintaining uh, the bioswells around Milwaukee. Um, I've been maintaining them for about three years now. Um, and to be honest with you, we don't do much in the winter as far as maintenance. We try to make sure um, the education piece is out there so that, you know, everybody who is doing a plow, drives a plow truck knows that there are bios in this stretch and, and that's not the best place to put the snow pile. Um, so yeah, we try to we try to get uh, education out there. But just um, as when we're selecting plants to put in bioswells, um, the plants are really just as, as important um, as the engineered soil that are filled through the water. Um, when we're choosing our plants, we make sure they're salt resistant, um, that they're native, um, part of this hardiness zone, um, mostly like a woody plant. Um, the the native plants have a better survival rate because obviously they're native. A lot of the plants that we're currently using is from trial and error. When we started putting in bioswells, we you know, took the salt resistant and hardiness native plants and we're like, all right, we're gonna start with these that are uh, most popular and kind of see which ones survive and which ones don't. Um, our, our oldest bioswells are uh, 10 years old. We actually just redid those recently. And a lot of those plants that were in there had been in there those 10 years. Um, so a lot of those species of plants I took note of to make sure that we continue to use them. And then also uh, the plant placement within the bioswell uh, plays a, a big part as far as uh, the health of the bioswell during the winter. Um, so some of the plant selection, this uh, uh, blue, Wonder Catmint, uh, the Happy Return Daylilies. They're great behind the curb. They're really hardy um, and they don't die with the salt, <laughs> with the salt usage. Um, and also the Ragoza Roses and the Russian Sage are really hardy plants and we found that uh, they're hard to kill, I guess. Um, so the salts, um, even there's some bios that have had snow piles in them and these plants uh, come back every spring um, just as happy as they were. Um, so plant placement um, in the bioswells. So we don't plant plant, uh, plant the plants within two feet of the curb. 
um, because regular salt can bounce off the curb, uh, bounce off of the road behind the curb. Um, we use hardy woody shrubs um, in the bottom and then grasses in between. Um, and the grasses also help to provide a winter interest, um, which is something that is a, a little bit newer. We used to just tear down or cut down all the grasses in the fall, but um, we've we've recently decided to leave them up and you can see the switchgrass and the Carl Forrester grass. Um, they just add some winter interest. Um, they, you know, show you that there is something landscaped here um, and to not put your stockpile, snow stockpile here. Um, and then there's a picture uh, from this winter for a bioswell that we left um, the, the grass is up. And then as well in the bottom, um, those are uh, red twig um, dogwoods and they turn red and the um, Carl Forrester grass is in the forefront of that in that photo. So it's nice to just use the different plants that provide um, interest all year round. But uh, more recently, the winter interest is something that we've picked up here in the city in Milwaukee. Um, so our road salt usage, we do use a brine solution. Um, and I have found that since we've been using it more often, the plants are not dying as often, um, especially the ones behind the curb. Um, so I did a little research as to the brine solution that we're using, and it's a 23.3%. Um, and that's just the kind of like the bare minimum for the snow not to stick to the pavement. Um, so this brine helps to use less snow. So uh, the Department of Public Works, um, when they hear it's going to snow, they go ahead and get their truck ready and they brine the streets and it holds for up to three days. Um, and then um, it, it helps to, for them not to have to apply so much salt, which is a great plus for us, um, not only for the roadways, but for the bioswells and your your car as well. Appreciate that. Um, so, and salt and snow piles and bioswells are, yes. So when I found when there was a large uh, snow uh, pile that was put into a bio a couple years ago, we did have some problems with those plants the next spring. Um, so that is like a direct correlation that I have found. Um, so green roofs. So I'll be honest, up front, this is not totally my expertise. I have reviewed a few and we have one next door. The uh, one on the right is uh, on top of the city building next door to me that I see out of the window and kind of watch all winter. So um, I do, I do know a little bit. Uh, so I know the green roofs are designed with a snow load and a safety factor to ensure that the roof is struct structurally sound. Um, the plant selection is key as well um, with the bioswells with the green roof. So a smaller plant, um, I, we don't use like succulents, like a lot of the research that I look looked into use succulents, but we don't usually. Um, we use like short grasses, um, we use like aster, um, and then for the maintenance of the green roofs, uh, I haven't really seen much maintenance. Usually we prep in fall, so we do a fall pruning. We cut down all the woody plants, um, make sure everything is gets cut down um, on top of the roofs. And then um, I haven't seen much snow removal, but um, I'm sure th that there is snow removal being done um, on green roofs as well, just to keep the uh, integrity of the roof um, intact. So uh, the permeable pavement. Um, so we have installed a lot of um, more so green um, alleys. So we put in a base course across the whole alley, and then we have a strip of perme uh, permeable pavers down the middle. Um, and that uh, that helps to you know, collect the water across the whole alley uh, and then brings it down to the catch basin. We don't plow the alleys, but uh, because of the way that the blocks are situated, it they stay warmer because of the air that gets into the um, pockets. Um, but we talked to the DNR um, about the permeable pavement and um, they're designed for water quality. Um, and let's see, they, we have the pervious concrete, the cast in place or the precast porous asphalt, and then the blocks or pavers. Um, I'm some more familiar with blocks and pavers because that's what I've seen installed um, and I've seen uh, some maintenance. Um, so um, operation and material maintenance, uh, minimal surface, uh, surface cleaning. Um, so I know of some permeable pavement that has been plowed over and 
like it performed fine, like Tom showed in his presentation. Um, and the sun uh, beating down on it is an uh, absolute plus. And like he said, the if there is any melt, some snow melt, it'll permeate right through the pavement um, and not cause so much black ice. Um, so, and you don't need um, sand or salt on the permeable pavement because there, because of that reason, there's no ice formation. Um, and like I said, the openings within the pavement allow uh, the soil below to keep from freezing. So there's less of a ice hazard on the permeable pavement. Um, there, there we have a couple of examples of where we use uh, permeable pavement in parking lots. Um, the zoo is one of them, and those are the pictures on the side. Um, did you want? Did you want to talk about the sports complex? So we um, reached out to um, the counties because um, they have uh, permeable pavement as well. And this was one example where they had a two acre parking lot with half of it being interlocking pavers. Some of the observations they did they used salt on theirs, but they said they had to use very little. Um, they didn't notice any heaving of the bricks. And I know Sarah can kind of talk about that as well. Um, and they used a regular plow blade. They did notice ice melted very rapidly after plowing because of the darker surface. They did not see any pooling or refreezing of water during the winter. Yep, and uh, really the only thing that I've seen with, uh, as far as the permeable pavement blocks, um, are the edges where they're encased in the regular concrete. They get um, they get worn down, and and which is normal, but uh, I. I know that's from the the blade of the um, the plows. So that's one thing that I've really observed as far as um, wear and tear on the permeable pavement. Um, and so then finally, we're just going to talk about some um, real world examples from some nonprofits in town that work on great infrastructure projects and the experience that they've had in the winter. Um, the first nonprofit is called Reflow, and they they do a lot of engineering and green infrastructure design for schools and playgrounds and parks. And this is a park that they've done. They install these um, large underground cisterns that are hooked up to monitoring software. They work with a company called Opti. And so if a large rain event is scheduled to come in the summertime, they can empty out. There's a um, controlled uh, like uh, valve and so they can empty out the cistern so it can hold the maximum capacity of water in a large storm event in the summer. Um, they said in the past few winters they've um, closed the valve just to see how much water um, when we do get the rare rain events in the winter when um, the ground is frozen and there won't be any infiltration. So this um, small park um, they have this, um, let's see um, 7,000 gallon or 26,000 liter um, underground cistern and in uh, like a 24 hour period in a rain event in the winter um, it captured almost a thousand cubic feet of water that normally would have just ran off or caused um, basement backups or flooding. Um, this is another project that they did in collaboration with the city of Milwaukee. Um, it was a former brownfield that the city worked to clean up and now it's an urban farm and it has a 40,000 gallon cistern or 150,000 liter um, underground cistern. So they did the same thing and closed the valve in the winter. Um, and in um, about a 48 hour period, they, they captured um, about 2,500 cubic feet of water. Um, so they noticed that it really does um, help these areas that are prone to, uh, prone to flooding um, capture some of these rain events in the winter or when the ground is frozen. And um, finally, a nonprofit called Clean Wisconsin. They do a lot of outreach and education to residents in areas that have um, a lot of issues with flooding. Um, and so they help them install rain gardens, help them install um, rain barrels. So I reached out to them to see what kind of information that they give to these homeowners to prep their residential green infrastructure for the winter. Um, they said every fall they send out a letter to everyone that they've done outreach to or done projects with. They give them a detailed description of the necessary steps to remove their rain barrels. Um, they have had, you know, a person who had a full rain barrel left it out in the winter and it cracked. Um, so they can tell them to drain the rain barrel, how to plug the hole where the diverter piece was located, and then steps for like winterizing their rain garden, including cutting back some of the plants, but also leaving some plant varieties um, that contain seeds for food sources for 
animals during the winter. And then finally they host like a, you know, winter time around November kind of celebration for everyone that installed uh, green infrastructure from the previous years. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. Yep. Wonderful. Thank you so much, guys. I know that was a lot of information to uh, to cram into a small amount of time, so I really appreciate it. Um, so now we have just about over 10 minutes for questions, and I see some questions have already started to come in the chat box. If you have questions, um, go ahead and just put them in the chat box, and I'll read them out, and hopefully we will get to uh, most of them. So the first question is uh, for Tom. And it's from Andrew with the city of Prince George, which is in British Columbia. And she's asking how much the snow dump bioretention design cost. Um, the design is probably on the order of uh, 10,000 US dollars. And the construction uh, cost itself was probably on the order of um, 50 to 60,000 US dollars. And the maintenance, uh, again, uh, depending on the load, at a minimum, you'd be using a vector truck on it about twice per year. Great. Thanks, Tom. Um, and then Bert here, just uh, a little FYI that the Canadian Standards Association released two standards for bioretention systems, one for the design and one for the construction in October 2018, and cold climate considerations are included. Great. Thanks, Bert. Uh, all right. So Ira from Vermont. Um, who's with a Storm Smart program wants to know if any of the presenters have experience with managing small scale um, green stormwater infrastructure for homes or small businesses. Um, uh, this is Tom. We've done some with homeowners um, as far as um, designing and implementing systems. Um, they're much more lower scale or low key. So instead of a buyer tension, usually you're putting in a rain garden, which is a typically doesn't have pretreatment and typically doesn't have plumbing, or you're disconnecting downspouts, uh, permeable pavements are some things that the homeowners will do. And in some cases, infiltration systems. Great. Um, this, this is Elizabeth in Milwaukee, um, the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewage District in town here um, recently opened, um, they call it the Green Infrastructure Service Center. So they have uh, resources, it's open to the public. They have resources for businesses, but as well as homeowners. So they kind of have like some mm -hmm. pre-designed specs for rain gardens. They have a lot of information on how to connect to a rain barrel at your home. Um, they have grant writing resources so it's kind of like a you know a great resource for the community and they're open you know normal business hours anyone can pop in and a lot of homeowners do come in there and get help with especially with uh, rain gardens because they're a little bit more you know labor intensive than a rain barrel and they don't want to hit any you know like utilities or anything like that so um, we have that in Milwaukee and it's people seem to really love it great thanks Elizabeth um, so Jonathan Brisson from the city of Brassard uh, in Quebec, I believe. Uh, Tom, is the bioretention system efficient in clay, sale, uh, in clay soils? Uh, two, two ways of answering that. Uh, there's the hydrologic efficiency and then there's the water quality efficiency. So hydrologically, you would not expect a lot of infiltration in these uh, soils, but you, the performance metrics I showed, and all of the, these are available in our biennial reports on our website, um, are for what is coming through the bioretention media into the stone. So that is the, the little efficiency identified. So for water quality, there should be no difference to, irrespective of the soil type. The big difference is in um, infiltration capabilities. And typically, if you have more than about 12 to 15 percent clay in your soil, it's going to be extremely difficult to get infiltration. We do see that even in C, hydrologic group C soils, which typically you don't get credit for infiltration, we can see up to 90 percent volume reduction in those soils. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that most of the infiltration doesn't necessarily go through the bottom. Actually, a lot goes through the sidewalls. And uh, the more and more you go into urban environments, the more you find that 
the uh, disturbed soils actually have much higher infiltration rate in the upper horizons than at the very bottom of the system where you're required to measure infiltration rate. Thanks, Tom. Um, I actually have a question for Elizabeth and Sarah about the water-centric city in Milwaukee. And I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the process of how that came to be. Like, was the impetus more from your elected officials? Was it from staff? Was it from, you know, nonprofit or citizen groups? Um, it's just, it seems a pretty, you know, um, a pretty advanced and progressive uh, program compared to uh, where a lot of cities are right now. So I'd just be interested in learning a little bit more about how it came to be. Um, sure, yeah. So originally um, it was, um, a bullet point in the city's sustainability plan that passed uh, maybe like eight, eight years ago. Um, we passed a citywide sustainability plan and had different categories, energy, jobs, um, and water was a big one. And so it kind of just um, laid out like develop Milwaukee into a water central city. So we've kind of been working on it for years. Um, we do have this um, business and technology cluster in town and they have been a great resource and we have the um, multiple universities. We have a water law program in town at a university. We have the um, graduate and PhD freshwater science program. So um, the city works really well with all the universities to have interns come in and kind of tackle some of these problems or issues that, you know, are important and it gives the students an opportunity to get some real world experience. Um, I know some of the startup companies at the, um, at the cluster, the, the water council um, cluster, they have have tested out some of their um, startup like technologies with um, the city of Milwaukee or the Metropolitan Sewage District. So it kind of gives them an opportunity to try out their program and then, or their, um, their business and their technology, and then they can get some feedback and kind of, you know, build a clientele list. So overall, and we do have a lot, a lot of water nonprofits in town, which is amazing. And so it's kind of a great initiative to get everyone together and working, you know, on the same thing and kind of feel like we're all part of, a, you know, one big initiative helping. You know, I think ultimately it's kind of like fishable, swimmable waters. Everything kind of fits underneath that. And um, so it's it's been great. <laughs> cool. Great. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, I have a question for Tom about, um, you mentioned that the people factor with regard to green infrastructure implementation is often much more of the um, much more of a barrier than the engineering issues. And I'm just wondering if you could speak a little bit to about what in your experience has been able to kind of assuage or mitigate that people factor. Like what do you, what, what do the people need um, to be able to be kind of convinced of, uh, of the effectiveness of green infrastructure? Is it just more information? Is it um, examples? Is it, um, you know, proof of concept? What, what in your experience have you been finding? Um. First, a question for you, Christine. Will you be posting these slides on your website? I would love to, if that's all right. Yeah, it is, um, because this my answer is going to be wrapped around slide 68. This is a great question, but our biggest success has been with peer-to-peer -peer engagement. And what I mean by that is um, we had a lot of success in one community down here, Dover, New Hampshire, which at the outset, back in 2006, they weren't really thrilled with doing green infrastructure uh, implementation in the town. But by the end, the public works director has become the biggest champion. And anymore, when we go out and talk to communities, we like to have him with us because basically um, we're academic pinheads, but he's someone who has to deal with these issues day in and day out, the construction, the maintenance, and uh, just the decision to put them in. and. Uh, his peers tend to believe him more than they would believe an academic or anybody else. So uh, peer engagement has been really good. The challenge is getting that first peer. Um, and so there, again, back to slide 68, um, you know, you really need to have someone in that leadership position. Um, so you may have to engage in a community and find out who that person is. Um, and then after that, it does take education. It takes demonstration, public awareness. Um, recognizing that there have been past failures and 
letting people know what you've learned from those failures. Um, a lot of the uh, barriers I put on one of the first slides was all folklore. It's basically misinformation that gets keep passed, get, it keeps getting passed down. Um, and then lastly, the economics itself. Uh, studies have been done that demonstrate that um, the green infrastructure systems are cheaper, less expensive than conventional gray infrastructure. And at the end of the day, I think that's one of the biggest arguments because at the uh, what we're basically spending in many of these urban areas are public funds. And I'm a taxpayer. I certainly would like to see my taxes going to infrastructure that has uh, the best cost effectiveness. Great. Thank you, Tom. And um, yeah, we will, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we have been recording the, um, the webinar today. And um, as long as Elizabeth and Sarah are also okay with it, we'll be sharing the slides um, on our, uh, so I'll send out an email to everyone who registered for the webinar after with that video recording and, and those slides as well. Um, and other than that, uh, thank you so much, Tom, Sarah, and Elizabeth. That was really, really informative. A lot of information to take in, um, so I'm sure we'll need to go over it again. But uh, thank you so much for um, volunteering your time, and uh, hopefully everyone's leaving a, a little more learned than when they came. So thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone.